Greetings. Welcome to another Roland Rambles. Guess what? We're going to talk about economics. We're going to discuss how it is that everything, I mean everything, that costs businesses more money goes down and ultimately is paid by the end consumer. Let's say you have a business. You make something. That something costs a dollar. You came to this cost by factoring in all of the parts that you have to pay for, all of the all of the items that go into it, that you know, disposable or whatever, the um, all the constituent components and whatnot that create the part, all of the labor that has to go into putting those things together to make the part, and then you give yourself I don't know a 10, 20 percent markup on the part so that you make money past your expenses, plus a little cushion for unexpected surprise expenses. Now let's do some inflation. You know, the thing that's been happening the entire time that COVID has been a thing, ever since Joe Biden took office, basically. Mad inflation, because we just can't stop printing money. Money printer go burr. You know, all that money does something. It dilutes the value of existing money. So because of that, let's say everything goes up about 40%, which the average is 40%. So now your parts cost 40% more to create the part that you sell. All of the items that are required to make it, 40% more. But that also means your workers need to pay uh, or need to have 40% more money because now for them to continue buying what they buy, they have to make 40% more money. Everything goes up 40% including your margin. You still need to make the money that you're making. So that means to make the equivalent amount of money so that nothing changes because of the inflation in question, your dollar part is now $1.40. Are you a greedy evil corporation for doing this? No. No, you are not. Because it's $1.40 because everything went up 40%. You didn't choose to make everything go up 40%. But the people that you buy your steel from, the people that you buy your pre-made bolts from, the people you buy your wood, your plastic, your fiberglass, your cloth, whatever it is that you use to put your stuff together, it all went up about 40%. And if it went up 40%, that means it costs you 40%. And that means that, you know, it, it, it has to go up 40% just on the parts side. and because your workers have to pay more of that. They gotta go up 40%. Everything just goes up 40%. That's the way inflation works. Deal with it. A dollar is now worth a dollar 40, or rather, a dollar 40 in today's money is effectively a dollar in yesterday's money. That's, that's just how the inflation game is played. So you now have, every dollar that you have has gone down in value by whatever 10 divided by 14 or 5 divided by 7 is, yeah, <clears throat> um, two-sevenths of its value has been lost. So any money you have in savings or stocks or whatever, assuming you don't magically get a boost up to, you know, 40% higher, has lost two-sevenths of its value. I'm not going to go into exactly how I calculated that, partly because I'm driving. But anyway, that's how inflation works. And guess what? That means you charge $1.40 to the people who buy the thing instead of a dollar. That means you're, you know, it, I don't know what, uh, a cheap toy? Well, now it costs a dollar to make. If it costs a dollar to make, that means it's going to be a dollar. Thank you very much for your dollar. Uh, $1.40, that is. So that also means that anybody who buys your item also needs to make 40% more money to continue buying it as if nothing had changed. This is how inflation works. Let's ditch inflation for a minute and talk about um, this, this wonderful genius idea that uh, I believe Kamala Harris put out where she's going to tax unrealized capital gains. I don't remember the numbers, but I think it was 28% tax on unrealized capital gains. <clears throat> the problem with taxing unrealized gains is that they're fake. You have to be a true moron to even think about 
taxing unrealized gains because unrealized gains don't exist. If I give you a dollar and you have this market where people can pay for um, that dollar, like the dollar buys a ticket and that ticket's worth a dollar and then, you know, more people want a piece of that ticket because my business is growing. So they want to, um, they want to own one of those tickets because it's worth more money. They're willing to pay more money for it. So now the price goes up $1.40, but the thing is I'm still holding a ticket. I'm not holding $1.40, I'm holding a ticket that currently is worth $1.40. Okay, so what happens? What, what is this tax on unrealized capital gains? It means that that 40 cents that I gained for this ticket, <clears throat> keep in mind I haven't sold the ticket for $1.40. I don't actually have the 40 cents. It's all on paper, it's all fake. It's all monopoly money. It's play money. It's not real. That's why it's called unrealized. Unreal is literally in the title. Unrealized gains are unreal. They aren't actual gains. They are on paper if you sold it today and managed to get the instantaneous market rate that these are going for. Ignoring all of the network effects of you selling that stuff, what happens? Well, you theoretically get $1.40, but you're gonna tax me on the 40 cents that my ticket, we're just calling it a ticket, like it's a little ticket that you, you know, the paper tickets you get at a raffle or whatever, or, uh, or you know, for a random drawing. It's sort of the same thing. So tickets worth a dollar. Oh, well now people are trading these tickets for a dollar and 40 cents instead of a dollar. So I've made 40 cents, so I need to be taxed on that 40 cents. If I have a thousand tickets that I bought for a thousand dollars, now it's a thousand four hundred. Now I need to be taxed on the 400. And if, if we tax it at, I don't know, they said 28%, right? So it was 28% of 400. That's 2856, 112. That's um, $112. So I have, I have, let's be clear, I bought what, a thousand tickets for a dollar. So I have a thousand dollars of tickets. It goes up to $1,400 of tickets. So now you're saying at the end of this year, because my tickets are worth 1,400 on paper, because that's what other people are willing to pay for them right now, that I have to pay you $112 for the luxury of having that ticket. So really it's not worth $1,400. It's worth 13, 1290, 1288. So now the ticket's worth 1288 instead of, instead of 1400. I paid a thousand, so this unrealized gain, this four hundred dollars I never had in the first place, I now have to pay over a hundred. I, I have to pay over a quarter of it to the government because I simply have the ticket, and other people say it's worth this amount. Now, keep in mind, I could sell the ticket tomorrow, and perhaps I'll only get a thousand dollars. So. It, it, there's no guarantee the ticket retains its value. You're just saying, oh, well, right now it's worth this much, so you have to pay taxes on how much other people are willing to pay for it. That's stupid, because what other people are willing to pay for it doesn't matter. I don't actually have the money. If you do this across the entirety of the, the ticket network, every ticket holder has to pay. Uh, let, let's just do a couple quick calculations. So in my head here, and I'm probably going to roll it up to 30 so that I don't have to keep doing hard math. So we have 1288 after the first year. <clears throat> What's 30% of 1288? It's um, 128.8. We'll just call that 128 um, times 3, 256, 384. Um, that can't possibly be right, though. Oof. And yet it is. Um, but now if it's 1288 and we originally bought it at a thousand, technically we're still at 288 of gains. So that's actually the number we need to work with. So what's 30% of that? 2856, uh, 84, we're we'll just call it 84. So now your 1288 has gone down to 1208 the second year. Um, you can see that you have an exponential loss every year, even if you haven't actually gotten the money. What this will do is it will cause people to mass sell off things that they would have capital gains on. Now remember, a lot of people don't understand what capital gains even are. 
capital gains are not just stock, which the ticket thing I keep talking about, that's really what I'm talking about is stock. But your house, capital gains. Technically, if you sell anything like a, like a car, um, that would be considered, I believe, a capital gain. I mean, the, the, any big ticket item that you could think of selling is potentially capital gains. So if you sell some, if you have an item and you've made any money on it, your house goes up in value, you'll be taxed on the difference between how much you paid for the house and how much it's worth today. If you, if you have a $100,000 house that has gone up to 150,000, you will be taxed on $50,000 of value in your home that you don't have as actual money. If this happens, and you don't just have that lying around, what's 28% of $50,000? Well, 10% is 5,000, 20% is 10,000, 30% is 15, so it's probably about 14 grand. Do you just happen to have 14 grand lying around? No, no you don't. So what are you gonna do? You have no choice but to sell your home to pay the government taxes on the capital gains that you haven't realized. You haven't sold your home yet, so what are you supposed to do? Mass sell-offs, guaranteed, if you do this. Another thing, price controls, okay. If you put price controls in place on, say, groceries, the grocery stores will go out of business. Just full stop, no one will want to own a grocery store. If <clears throat> if I buy potatoes for a dollar per bag, or let's say five dollars a bag, and you say you cannot sell potatoes for more than five twenty a bag, you are saying that I'm not allowed to make more than twenty cents. Now, what happens when the potato costs go up to five fifty a bag? Well, now you're saying, well, we're instituting price controls and we've said 520. Your supplier wants to charge you 550, but you can only sell for 520. Do you think that I'm actually going to buy potatoes? Do you think I'm gonna buy potatoes and resell them? Hell no, absolutely not. There is no way, not any day, that I would buy and resell potatoes at that point because of the price controls. So if, you, if these geniuses that want to run the government it actually institute this price controls on unfair price gouging bastards and whatever, then grocery stores will go out of business because it's not price gouging. If it costs me $5.50 to buy something from a distributor that I can then sell in smaller portions to people like you, then why would I ever buy that for $5.50 and sell it for $5 it doesn't make any sense. I'm not in business to lose money. So I'd rather shut my business down and cut my losses than sell you what you need to survive. <clears throat> a lot of what they call price gouging is really just supply and demand. And a lot of so-called price gouging only is gouging because the government won't get its hands out of stuff. But this is the thing. Everything ultimately is paid for by the end consumer. If you have a CEO and you're like, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna tax the CEO 20% more of their income. Let's say that a CEO makes a million dollars and the government wants to tax the CEO 20% of that income. So that's 1 million, 20% is 200 grand. That means that the company is gonna have to make $200,000 more money from something, somewhere. Do you think for one second that the CEO is gonna go, oh, I guess I'll just have to give up my pay. Oh well, it's simply not gonna happen. Nobody's gonna give up their pay because the government says, oh, let's tax these people more money. Instead, what happens is everything across the company's various product and service lines needs to make 200 grand more money. <clears throat> what happens when you do that? Well. Let's say you sell 200,000 whatever widgets in a year. I don't know how much the widget costs. That means that each widget goes up by a dollar. Let's say you sell 2 million of them. That means they go up 10 cents. It doesn't seem like much. 
But the problem is everything that goes into making those widgets also is going to go up by that percentage. <clears throat> because you're not talking about taxing 20% of this one guy. The company that makes part A and part B and part C and part D, they're all also going to get taxed that amount, which means that they also have to raise the prices on the constituent parts, which means all of these companies are gonna be throwing another 10 cents or whatever, five cents, you take your pick, extra into the cost of each constituent part. So by the time it's all said and done, you might have a several dollar increase, not a 10 cents increase on the cost of these 2 million widgets you sell per year. And that's the problem. Ultimately, in the end, no matter what you do to cost businesses or rich people or whatever more money, the way that they deal with that is by passing those costs through to the people who actually ultimately buy their products. And anybody who buys those products has to pass those costs through for their products as well. So it, it's this cascading effect. What, what might be a penny becomes a dollar after it snowballs through a bunch of different people. And the problem is you never see that you're paying this. These taxes are ultimately taxes on you that you never see coming out of your paycheck. If I pay a dollar for an item, nowhere on the receipt does it say that when this item was manufactured, we, we paid an extra one cent <clears throat> to you know the, the cotter pin company over last year for the cotter pins that were used to hold this thing together. I don't know why you got your widget held together by cotter pins. Uh, that's your problem, not my problem. But in any case, um, your widget's held together by cotter pins and they go up more and, and, and it doesn't go on the receipt. What does go on the receipt is now that now that widget is 10 cents more or a dollar more or whatever, and that's it. All you see is the increase in the total price. You don't see why it went up. And you have to actually understand economics a little bit to understand why it might have gone up. Uh, but it always boils down to costs went up. What are costs? Costs are what you have to pay someone else to get the thing. Well, what do you, how do they determine how much you have to pay to get the thing? Well, it's how much they had to pay to get the thing plus how much they had to pay people to do the thing to modify the thing to be what they sell, plus the margin so that they're not making zero dollars because businesses aren't charities. So a combination of markups because the businesses have to make money plus markups because taxes, uh, and there you go. And there's this foolish notion that, oh, everybody's charging way too much money for stuff. They might be. It's possible that they are charging way too much money. The way that you tell them that is you stop buying the things that are overpriced. That causes the market, you, you are the market, to control the price naturally, organically, by not buying the product in the first place when it's overpriced. If you refuse to buy it at the higher price, they'll have no choice but to lower the prices somehow or stop stocking the item entirely. It's not complicated. It really is not that difficult to understand. And yet a lot of people don't understand it. They think that, oh, we'll just tax the millionaires and billionaires. If we just tax the millionaires and billionaires, then there'll be plenty of money to pay for everything. All the normal people who don't have a lot of money will suddenly prosper if we just tax the millionaires and billionaires. I don't understand economics. I'm just some schmuck from the Northeast. I don't understand anything about how an economy actually works. I just assume that if you turn the money wheel up, that the money number go up, and that's all there is to it, because I'm a fucking idiot. This is the ultimate problem with economics. Everything really does trickle down to the last person in the line. And yes, I understand that trickle down, trickle down economics from Reagan didn't work, okay. You can say that all day long, but the problem is that we have a corporatist system, not a capitalist one. We have a system that was capitalist, but slowly over time has been captured by the capitalists, uh, the, cap the corporations rather, <clears throat> and they control the entities that are supposed to control them, that are supposed to rein them in when they get too heavy handed. 
And now um, all they have to do is grease the palms of some senators and congressmen and they can get their way legislatively. They can get laws passed to put red tape in to prevent competitors that are uh, smaller and more agile from coming into the market because there are too many legal restrictions uh, preventing them from being able to do so. That they're, These big corporations, they basically run everything and it's not okay that they do so. Unfortunately, it's also not something that uh, is easily fixed. You can't just boot them out at this point because lobbying is legal and Citizens United says corporations have freedom of speech because corporations are really just groups of people coming together to perform a common goal or task or whatever. So because it's composed of people, those people have free speech, therefore the corporation has free speech. Uh, I don't know that that should be the way it is because corporations are how power is consolidated. And if you are consolidating power, you should lose freedom as a result because you have more control over things. But nonetheless, this isn't really where I want to get into that philosophy too deeply. I believe in a libertarian triangle where if you are at the top, you have the least rights. And when you're at the bottom, when you have the least amount of control, you have the most rights. Um, not everybody agrees with that, but I don't care because they're wrong. Every tax ultimately ends up being a tax on the middle class. Now, why is it a tax on the middle class and not on the poor? Uh, because the poor don't pay taxes. The poor get welfare benefits to the point that they have a net positive from the tax system, not a net negative. So if I make five grand a year, but I get, uh, I don't know, like, let's say six grand in food stamps, six grand in insurance, uh, Medicaid or whatever. So 12 grand worth of food and insurance, uh, just, just as an example, I am effectively making $18,000 when you combine the government assistance plus the meager income, 18 grand. Now, if I make 10 grand a year, and they yank those things, cut them in half, for example. Um, now I'm making six grand in benefits and 10 grand in money, um, and you've hit the welfare shelf. See, you've actually long ago hit the welfare shelf because now you're making 16 grand a year, so you are earning four grand more a year, but the loss in benefits is actually a net negative, so you have lost $2,000 by making $4,000 more. Thus, the motivation for people who are extremely poor to stay that way, because why, why, why would you give up your free money? Why? That, that, that's insanely stupid. Why would you give it up? You know, I, I understand maybe if you have prospects to make 40 grand a year instead, maybe then you do ditch the benefits because you'll make so much more. But the welfare shelf makes sure that people who are really poor stay that way and they don't pay much in the way of taxes. If they pay anything at all, you're actually not required to file a tax return below a certain amount in the United States because they literally are just like, well, you don't really owe enough or you don't owe anything um, to matter. In review, the poor do not pay taxes because they don't make money and they have benefits that make sure that they stay poor because they'll lose them if they don't. The rich make enough money they don't care and taxing the rich causes the rich to then roll that tax back into costs um, in their businesses and such so that normal people, you know, the middle class, end up paying for those taxes on those rich people. This is how all taxes are taxes on the middle class. But look at the journey it took to get here. Look at all the garbage I had to explain for you to understand that. And that's why most people don't understand economics. Because if they did, they would understand that any tax ultimately is a tax on the middle class. Now, yes, you can come up with fringe cases. You can come up with rare exceptions. You know, you can come up with the guy who works in finance, who makes 200 grand a year, who's gonna get taxed, but he's gonna ask for a raise and that's gonna be 220 grand. And that raise, guess where that comes from? That extra 20 grand, where, where's he working? Wherever he's working, they're going to roll that 20 grand of expenses back in. So yeah, even though you think you have an exception to this rule, you do not have an exception. You just think you do. 
in the end, it does not matter how idealistic you are, it doesn't matter how much you appeal to emotion, it doesn't matter how much compassion you think you have, it doesn't matter how much you cry about poor people needing to have money and all the wealth being concentrated into the upper echelon of the 0.01%. At the end of the day, raising taxes only hurts the middle class, the people that you claim to be trying to help. Normal everyday working families, those are the ones who get punished the most whenever you f fire off some sort of new taxation. And it can be really, really bad. So yeah, if you want to crush the entire nation under the weight of your own stupidity, then yeah, by all means, keep pushing policies like that. Meanwhile, people like me who aren't stupid and who actually understand how things function in society, we're not going to advocate for stuff like that because guess what? We know better. We know it won't work. We know that that's not going to help anybody. It's a poison pill in the end. And you think it's going to help because you think turn knob up, money number go up. Therefore, more money make things better. And that's not how economies work. It's just flat out wrong. So enjoy being wrong um, if you want to, but I'd rather you come back to some actual sense, some really simple basic facts, and understand that what you're advocating for whenever you push for these policies, it's just gonna basically crush everybody under that weight. You are only hurting the people that aren't in that top echelon or at the very bottom of society that can get benefits. Anywho, and this is why, by the way, libertarians say taxation is theft, or at least part of it. Like, comment, subscribe. Talk to you later. What are you doing? I don't understand what you're doing.